Hello, welcome to today's accelerated introduction to the field of astrochemistry. Today I invite you to reflect with me on the remarkable set of scientific discoveries in the fields of chemistry, physics, and astronomy, which have led us to a much greater understanding of the nature of our, our universe. As an outline of our accelerated tour today, since our sun and our solar system is only one of billions of stars and solar systems, to understand the larger universe, we've had to explore a lot more places than we could ever realistically travel to. Thus, almost everything we know about the larger universe, we know by careful study of light emitted by distant stars. We'll discuss nuclear fusion as the source of this enormous light and uh, energy output of all stars. Nuclear fusion in the core of stars, particularly at the end life of stars, is actually believed to produce all the known chemical elements that make up all of matter in the universe. The ongoing search for life beyond the Earth is of high interest to us all. In the past few decades, discovery of living organisms on areas of the Earth in environments previously thought to be completely non-compatible with life has led scientists to reconsider earlier conclusions about where life may actually exist, including beyond our planet. We'll discuss an increasing intensity of effort ongoing to look for chemical signatures of life beyond our Earth. I often find a picture's worth at least a thousand words. With that in mind, I've concluded a non-narrated slideshow at the end of my presentation today, which includes brief snapshots of astrochemistry that I think may stimulate you to explore this area a lot further. By definition, chemistry is the study of matter, what it consists of, its properties, and changes. Astrochemistry is a specialized subfield of chemistry related to the study of the chemistry of stars and other celestial objects, closely connected to the fields of nuclear chemistry, physics, and mathematics. Our Sun, other stars in our Milky Way galaxy, and stars in the larger universe contain the vast majority of matter in the universe. The matter in stars consists mostly of the simplest chemical element in our periodic chart, that being hydrogen, and a smaller amount of the next larger chemical element, helium. Since hydrogen and helium are relatively rare on the Earth, most of us are unlikely to have uh, much of a common daily encounter with either element, other than, say, those helium-filled balloons at your birthday party. It may be uh, surprising to consider that the matter we encounter and have become so familiar with on the Earth represents less than a tenth of a percent of the total matter in the universe. That fact should help you appreciate the enormous mass of our sun and other stars in comparison to celestial bodies like our planet. The matter composing planets is quite insignificant as compared to that of stars. By the way, hydrogen and helium are gaseous physical state on the Earth. They exist in a distinctly unique and interesting physical state known as the plasma state at the extremely high temperature and pressures present in the core of stars. The element that's uh, particularly relevant to our discussion today is the element helium. Helium is the second most abundant element in our universe, but it's relatively rare on the Earth, as we'll discuss in a few minutes. It's mostly found in stars, as I discussed on the last slide. But also, uh, like stars, gas planets, like in our solar system, Jupiter and Saturn, are composed mostly of those same uh, two elements, hydrogen and helium. And in fact, gas giant planets, um, like Jupiter and Saturn, are also many times called failed stars because they contain the same basic elements, mostly hydrogen and helium, as do stars. But unlike stars, they have not attained the critical mass that's required for um, the gravitational force to be large enough to initiate nuclear fusion of hydrogen, which we'll discuss further in a couple slides. Perhaps one of the most important discoveries and inventions was that of the visible light spectrometer um, and the ability to separate white starlight into the component colors of the visible spectrum. 
um, was first sort of uh, discovered by Isaac Newton around uh, the late 1600s by passing white starlight or sunlight through a glass prism, he was able to, to uh, resolve the component color frequencies into um, what our eyes perceive as uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet light. Furthermore, um, this was further refined um, by the, the invention of diffraction gratings, um, actually perhaps first by David Rittenhouse here in Philadelphia in 1785, we'll talk about that in a minute, highly refined by Joseph Fraunhofer in uh, Bavaria in the early 1800s. Given um, the local uh, connection, I thought it'd be worth talking a little bit about the Rittenhouse diffraction grading. So historical accounts suggest that the first man-made diffraction grading was made or invented by Philadelphia inventor and astronomer David Rittenhouse in about 1785. And the accounts suggest that Francis Hopkinson, who was one of the lesser known signers of the Declaration of Independence, who was also a member of the Franklin um, Ph Philosophical Society with Rittenhouse, uh, noted that light when visible light shone through a silk handkerchief that it was it had some unusual uh, diffraction patterns and uh, Rittenhouse actually followed this up and actually created the first diffraction grating by taking hairs and strung them um, in a in a plate apparatus very finely spaced and he was actually able to observe the diffraction of light through through this grating However, neither he nor Hopkinson pursued this to any sort of practical application. And in fact, the credit for taking this to a practical application goes to Fraunhofer in Bavaria. Independently of David Rittenhouse in Philadelphia, historical accounts suggest that Joseph von Fraunhofer in Bavaria independently discovered the use of uh, gratings to separate light, visible light, into its component wavelengths. He used a wire grating system and was able to separate visible light into a, a spectrum of, of its component uh, frequencies. And uh, furthermore, he, he sort of realized the, the practical application of this in astronomy. He actually was able to um, resolve um, visible light from stars like our sun and actually had with with the use of this finer um, higher resolution grading rather than prisms was able to demonstrate you could see these independent uh, absorption lines which are shown as the dark lines above in that are superimposed on the continuum of a uh, visible spectrum from from our sun these are actually a later that were shown to be absorption lines of elements present in those stars like our sun individual elements present in the in those stars uh, that's kind of superimposed on a thermal radiation background uh, it's kind of a black body radiation background that's kind of continuous visible color uh, because of uh, he was the first to actually understand this practical application of gratings in, for the higher resolution uh, resolution of uh, visible light in its application to astronomy. He's considered the father of the visible light spectrometer in its application to astronomy. And because of his work, Bavaria actually overtook England as the leader in optics research in the early 1800s. Shortly after the um, discovery of gratings and the ability to separate light using grating spectrometers, um, Bunsen and Kirchhoff in Germany uh, experimented with uh, flame uh, spectro spectroscopy in which they noted that different metals when they were put into uh, burning flames they actually realized that you could identify the metal by the color of the flame that you that was emitted and furthermore that light could be separated into the component wavelengths as kind of a fingerprint of what element was present this was a really important initial discovery that suggested that chemical elements had emission spectra that were very unique to that element. 
So over the uh, next few decades, it became clear to scientists and inventors around the world that um, indeed there were these unique chemical sig signatures in the emission spectra of elements. And it became particularly interested, interesting to astronomers that uh, you could look at stars like our sun and actually um, try to determine what uh, elements might be present there by looking at their the the, uh, the component wavelengths. The problem with that was the brightness of of a star like our sun are, is so bright that the the there's a corresponding uh, continuous wavelength of emission that sort of overwhelms identifying individual emission spectra of elements. And so it was understood after a while in, in the late 1800s that uh, you needed to look at a star like our sun during a, a total eclipse to kind of attenuate the light intensity to where you could actually look for elemental emission lines. And in fact, in the uh, total uh, spectral uh, eclipse of uh, 1868, um, the, the, it really led to the identification of a, of a unique yellow uh, mission line in the spectrum of our sun. The total eclipse of August 1868 turned out to be an ideal time for English astronomer Norman uh, Lockyer to travel to British India and observe the emission spectra of our sun. After careful analysis, he and British colleagues came to the realization that our sun had a yellow emission line that was distinct from that of any known element on the Earth. And they named this new emission line the yellow D3 line to distinguish it from known emission lines of the known element sodium, which had yellow D1 and D2 emission lines very close to the wavelength of this new, uh, new line. This was quite an accomplishment given the resolution of spectrometers at the time was not, was not that great. And it was quite controversial, actually. Many scientists uh, debated this for quite a while. Although controversial, he and chemist Edward Franklin were confident of their conclusion and that this might be a new element not previously known on the Earth and named this putative new element helium after Helios, the Greek god of the sun. So amazingly, it took almost another 27 years until that element helium was actually discovered on the Earth. Um, it's a relatively rare element on the Earth, as it's known today. Um, actually, uh, the Scottish chemist Ramsey uh, first discovered all the noble gases, which helium is a member of, and actually got the Nobel Prize for that in 1904. The way he discovered helium on the Earth was he actually treated uranium ore with acid and showed that a gas was evolved. He then looked at the uh, emission spectrum of that gas and found out that it agreed with the emission spectrum that Lockyer had earlier uh, published on the uh, emission line of this new element that he named helium. So it took almost 27 years to actually discover that this gas was present on the Earth. It's a rel relatively rare gas on the Earth. Um, and in fact, Today, almost all the commercial production of helium comes from its recovery from natural gas wells out in the western states. So unlike the stars and gas planets, our planet has relatively uh, low uh, levels of helium, and it's believed to derive from a different source on, a, on the Earth. Most of the uh, helium is believed to have escaped into space during the evolution of the Earth. And in fact, um, the helium that we now have on the Earth in these deep mines is believed to actually come from a different source from the radioactive decay of elements that undergo alpha decay, like uranium and, and thorium and others. And uh, as I said, helium in the U.S. is now extracted from ga these gas wells out in the western states like Kansas, Colorado, Oklahoma, Texas, and Wyoming. So it's relatively rare on the Earth unlike uh, being almost 30% of the elemental composition of all the stars in the universe. So to make a very long story short, modern high resolution uh, grading spectrometers can actually resolve uh, the visible light from stars like our sun into uh, their component uh, spectra 
that are, are very complex, like shown on this slide, not only this continuous spectrum of, of, of color ranging from red to, to violet, but, but with overlaid upon that, these darker lines, that you see these Fraunhofer lines that are really uh, to signatures of elements that are present in, the, uh, in those stars uh, that are absorbing discrete wavelengths of light based on whatever the element is. So we're able to actually, even though we'll now ne be able to travel to many of these distant stars, we're able to pick out the elemental composition of those stars by looking closely at the emission spectra. And furthermore, stars, it's, it's been shown that stars that are moving away from us at some speed, um, this causes a, a red shift in these emission lines where they're shifted by a constant level based on the speed that they're moving away from us. And we actually can conclude how quickly uh, distant stars are moving away from us by changes in, in the emission spectra that we observe. So pretty amazing science. So what's understood about this enormous energy that, that stars um, generate and you know, what's, what's behind the enormous amount of light, energy, and heat that stars emit Really, what's understood is that a typical star begins as a thin cloud of hydrogen gas that under the force of gravity collects into a huge, dense sphere. So as it collects uh, larger and larger amounts of hydrogen gas, it becomes so dense that eventually it reaches a critical uh, size where its gravitational force is, is sufficient to ignite nuclear fusion. Um, it generates this vast energy of that, that star. And, um, you know, really the process of nuclear fusion is basically the, the simplest nuclei, the hydrogen nuclei is fused to eventually become helium. So this is really the understanding that uh, the presence of this almost 30% helium in stars is actually made by um, production from, from the hydrogen in that, in that star. So, as you recall, um, helium was confirmed to be a, an element with its discovery on the Earth by Ramsey in Scotland in 1895. And interestingly, it took more than 25 years um, until Arthur Eddington in the UK in 1920 um, actually put together um, and correctly speculated that the source of helium in our sun and in all stars was actually due to the fusion of hydrogen nuclei. So the, the fusion of hydrogen nuclei to, to form helium. Up to that point, no one was quite sure of what was responsible for the light and energy emission from stars. And in fact, they sort of envisioned that maybe it was like uh, combustion, just like uh, fire on the earth. And in fact, Eddington and other physicists realized that that really wasn't uh, the nature of that energy source. So Eddington was actually the first to correctly make this speculation. And uh, it's interesting that uh, the historians sort of refer to him as not only an astronomer, physicist, and mathematician, but as a kind of a popularizer of science and sort of as the Carl Sagan of his time. In uh, 1939, German-turned-American physicist Hans Bethe um, analyzed the different possibilities for reactions by which hydrogen is fused into helium. And he's actually able to define two processes that are responsible for uh, fusion in, in stars. In uh, stars the size of our sun, there's a proton-proton chain reaction that, that he was able to identify. And then in larger stars, larger than the mass of our sun, he defined a carbon-nitrogen-oxygen cycle um, that's responsible for the production of, of helium in larger elements. He went on to, um, he and others in the, in the in succeeding decades were able to um, really define other processes uh, like neutron capture and other, other processes, slow and and fast neutron capture that were responsible for fusion in 
very high energy situations that could generate all the elements in our periodic table. So the work of, of Hans and others in the following decades was able, were, were really resulted in the ability to recreate the fusion uh, reactions that occur in stars in physical laboratory environments on the Earth, which is, is really a, a big deal. Um, ironically, Hans Bethe, who was uh, opposed to the development of the hydrogen bomb after the development originally of the hydrogen of the fission atomic bomb, uh, was partly responsible for the development of the hydrogen bomb that was was first uh, produced in the 1950s, much more powerful than the nuclear bombs that were used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, he, uh, ironically, was was responsible for a lot of the uh, understanding that that enabled that to occur. Although he was philosophically against the development of such a, a weapon. So early in my chemistry career, I worked at the U.S. Department of Energy in one of the uh, U.S. Department of Energy national laboratories. Um, recently. The U.S. Department of Energy Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory out in California made a pretty big announcement in 2022. They uh, they actually announced that they had actually achieved a net energy gain in nuclear fusion um, process, somewhat similar to what actually occurs in the core of stars. And really, the interest in this is that this. Um, potentially could be, if scalable, could actually be a, an, an ener a source of energy that would greatly um, reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and some of the challenges that come with uh, the use of fossil fuels as our main source of energy. Of course, we also have nuclear fission that's been the basis of uh, most of the nuclear plants currently in operation, but uh, there's a lot of interest. There's been more than uh, a century, half a century of interest at the Department of Energy that we could use, uh, that, that nuclear fusion would be a much more environmentally friendly process without a lot of the nuclear waste and other thing, other concerns that come along with fission processes. So there's there's a really a lot of excitement around the idea of, of using um, nuclear fusion as a potential energy source going forward in the future. So perhaps one of the most interesting uh, topics to many of us is, um, are we alone in, in our solar system, our galaxy, the Milky Way, or our universe? And what do we mean by alone? Do we expect to find uh, you know, Martians? Or is it possible that you know, we may find elsewhere other uh, microbial life forms, anaerobic bacteria, cyanobacteria, so on? Um, really, the first interest in this really came with the Viking missions to Mars back in the uh, in 1976. Really, that was the first real direct attempt to determine whether there may be living organisms on on Mars, and that was really done using uh, labeled uh, uh, nutrient experiments in which these nutrients were put into the um, soil or the um, regolith on Mars and to determine whether or not there was any organisms that would release, for example, carbon dioxide or other volatile um, byproducts of metabolism. And in fact, many of those experiments seem to suggest um, that there actually was, in fact, Gil Levin, Gilbert Levin um, was the principal investigator with NASA on on these experiments and in his whole life he believed that those those experiments suggest that indeed there was um, metabolic activity in the soil of of the planet mars however um, many other folks at nasa and, and other scientists in in this in this field believe that most of those measurements were ambiguous and they other experiments were not able to detect any of the normal um, expected organic chemical signatures that there may be biological life on on Mars. So, you know, there's 
this has generated controversy to this day and a lot of additional interest in de detecting whether there may be uh, microorganisms and uh, other uh, organisms living on planets like Mars. Some recent uh, findings that have been uh, relatively mixed um, and, and mysterious suggest that there, there actually may be periodic um, pulsatile emissions of methane, this gas methane, on the surface, from the surface of, of Mars. And uh, on the Earth, um, anaerobic bacteria are normally responsible for producing methane, for example, in our, in our marshes along the um, uh, coasts of, of, of the East Coast. Um, anaerobic bacteria in the uh, marsh produce very large amounts of methane anaerobic bacteria in the guts of living animals like uh, like us or, or cows can produce this natural gas known as methane. So there's a lot of interest in kind of understanding whether this comes from a biological process or a uh, or some sort of chemical process that's not completely understood. So this is an ongoing um, an ongoing area of investigation by NASA, the European Space Agency and, and many others. So uh, many recent uh, press releases by spokes, NASA spokespersons like uh, NASA scientist Dr. Michelle Thayer um, suggests that um, much of the scientific community is opening up to the, the very real possibility that there may be my, at least microbial life um, existing elsewhere in our solar system. And uh, recent uh, press uh, statement by by Dr. Thayer, where she suggests that potentially as close as the atmosphere of Venus, um, you know, we may have the first evidence that, that we may have living organisms. That, that uh, statement is really based on research by um, an astronomer, Jane Greaves, who's at uh, Cardiff University in the UK. In 2020, they had announced that they had detected the presence of phosphine gas or the the, uh, the chemical signature of of, uh, chem of phosphine gas in the uh, in the high clouds of, of Venus. Um, normally, phos phosphine gas is also like methane, only produced by anaerobic bacteria on the Earth, and so that generated a, you know much interest and much controversy. While the initial report was met with a lot of controversy and perhaps uh, difficulty uh, repeating it by other astronomers. Her team has now uh, confirmed and detected again phosphine at deeper levels in Venus's atmosphere than before using the uh, James Maxwell Telescope at uh, Mauna Kea Observatory in Hawaii. So it does seem to be holding up that high in the atmosphere of Venus, there seems to be the, the, uh, the signature, the spectral signature of phosphine gas. So what's notable is up in the upper atmosphere of Venus, uh, temperatures are, are, are moderate compared to the enormously hot temperatures uh, known to be present on the surface of, of Venus, uh, which are upwards of 470 degrees centigrade. Up in the upper atmospheres in the, in the more moderated temperature zones, um, this is where there's, they seem to be uh, seeing the presence of this phosphine gas. So there's a lot of interest in whether there's the possibility that there's living bacterial life in the upper atmospheres of Venus. And by the way, our own atmosphere, um, we, we have bacteria living in our atmosphere as well. So there's, there's a lot of interest in this and in, in confirming whether this, uh, in fact, might be evidence that there may be living organisms um, in the upper atmosphere of another planet. So beyond our solar system, a lot of uh, effort by NASA and other space agencies is really looking, and, and astronomers in general, is really looking at um, planets orbiting stars other than our own star. And those, those are now known as exoplanets, or planets that exist outside our solar system. And uh, when I was in graduate school in the 1980s, it wasn't even clear there were uh, planets. It was postulated there were planets um, orbiting stars and other solar systems, but it was never really confirmed. 
it really wasn't until improved telescopes uh, like the uh, Hubble telescope and the James Webb telescope and many of the ground-based telescopes improvements and techniques really came about that we were able uh, to detect the presence of these um, these planets many times as they're transiting in front of their their corresponding star you can detect a an attenuation of the emission of light from that star and that's how they're able to detect the presence of these planets while they're not able to observe them directly by imaging that that planet because the planet itself is too or the star itself is too bright anyway um, a lot has been done in the last few years and now there's you know thousands upon thousands of confirmed exoplanets uh, orbiting uh, stars outside our solar system. A lot of interest in understanding what the um, atmosphere of those planets might look like, and it's actually possible using some of the current tele uh, astronomy techniques to um, get an idea of the the uh, composition, the elemental and uh, and our molecular composition of their atmosphere using various optical techniques. So I'd like to close with uh, on this NASA site that sort of confirms that we we now have, you know, at, at the time of this viewing, had over almost a 4,000 confirmed um, planets out, uh, orbiting stars outside our solar system. And there's more, almost 10,000 uh, candidates that are still under the process of confirmation. This is really, um, really the frontier of, of understanding our solar system and the possible search for life outside our solar system is understanding um, how could we uh, really detect things uh, on planets as far away as, as as planets outside our solar system which you know are light years away so in the in you know the thousands of years humanity has been contemplating the the universe we're really at the first generation of humans to know one thing for sure the stars beyond our sun are just teeming with planets and exoplanets and uh, space agencies around the world are, are really trying to understand which of these planets are most likely amendable to conditions uh, consistent with with life so i want to close today the narrated portion of my of my talk by uh, thanking all of you for your attention. And uh, for the students in the audience, I wanted to highlight that uh, there's a, a growing number of interesting careers in the aerospace-related uh, fields. Um, and uh, it's been sort of advertised that space companies are hiring in force. And uh, they're not just looking for scientists and engineers. Um, there's a, a growing need in the industry for skilled trades like welders, machinists, uh, software engineers, and other technical jobs in demand by companies building rockets, spacecraft, satellites, software systems, and so on. So I would encourage you, any of you that are interested in this, uh, this uh, space to, uh, to consider a career uh, in, this, in the allied uh, aerospace uh, field. And uh, Again, I'll uh, close today uh, thanking you for your attention, and I would encourage you to uh, view the uh, hyperlapse tour, uh, non-narrated non tour that follows in the following slides. Thank you very much.